And uh, John, this yeah. recording, we don't post it, but if you, if you want access to it. Um, You're free to do whatever you want with it. I'm fine. Okay. <laughs> Unless something goes horribly wrong. <laughs> So we won't see people who are in the um, audience. Uh, you'll just see them in the participant um, okay. attendee list on the on the sidebar. Is it better like that? I've always thought that it would be better to have the faces. The faces, yeah, because yeah, I is. don't know. When I've been a participant, it just feels I don't know. Yeah, it feels a certain type of way. I know. <laughs> Well, we have had, it's been a matter of, um, a con I, I think it, the webinar provides more features for the presenter, and then it also allows for um, more attendees, I think. That's my understanding. I could be wrong, though. Um, anyhow, um, okay, so thank you, everybody, for who has, who is uh, showing up, and um, See, we already have some feedback. Thank you, Alejandro. Yes. <laughs> Alejandro. Uh, um, you're here. Holy. We um, we'll start at 4.05. Um, and uh, we'll take it for, give it about one more minute. Oh. Okay. Alejandro, you have to show me how to divide my screen between my Word document that I want to look at to remember the title, the titles of all of John's books and articles, which I will mention today, all of them, uh, and, um, and Zoom. Is that something possible? See? Okay. So... Maybe after these, we, you can zoom in with me and share screens and do that. Or, okay. <laughs> there you go, collaboration. Okay, so um, I'll, so I'll get- So Alejandro was at UT Austin. Oh, okay, hi, hello. <laughs> and he's in Colombia now. Yeah, go ahead. Indeed, uh, okay. I'll this come. is your show. So a lot, <laughs> feel free to cut in as I start here. <laughs> Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Carlos Jackson. Uh, I'm faculty in the Chicana, Chicano, Chicanx Studies Department at UC Davis. And this year, um, I have the privilege of um, serving as chair of the Cultural Studies Graduate Group. Um, it's been a year that, to me, uh, escapes language escapes the ability to um, to signify the experiences that uh, we've been going through and living through. Um, an incredible precarious time that um, I feel personally grateful to the cultural studies students, faculty, and broader community for coming together and for just persisting and supporting one another through this time. And uh, yeah, so today is a very special presentation. Uh, John Hartigan, professor in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Texas at Austin, um, is gonna be giving a talk called The Social Lives of Wild Horses, an Ethnographic Perspective, and a talk that's gonna be introduced and moderated um, by our very own Marisol de la Cadena. Uh, and the way this talk came about was um, John had reached out to Marisol and Marisol had forwarded John's um, uh, work to me. And I in turn asked if Marisol would then um, uh, be willing to serve as a, uh, as a, as a moderator and discussant for John's uh, colloquium talk, uh, which uh, Marisol heartily um, agreed to. And uh, their work has a lot in to offer to one another. Um, 
and I believe uh, their work um, builds off of um, a very similar thread. Um, and so it's going to be a really interesting and I think powerful discussion today um, that I look forward to. And I'm going to start, if I may, um, with uh, the UC Davis land acknowledgement. I'd like to offer um, that we should take a moment to acknowledge the land on which we are gathered. For thousands of years, this land has been home of the Potwin people. Today, there are three federally recognized Potwin tribes, Kachil Dihi Band of Winton Indians of the Calusa Indian Community, Quetzal Dihi Winton Nation, and Yoka Dihi Winton Nation. The Potwin people have remained committed to the stewardship of this land over many centuries. It has been cherished and protected as elders have instructed the young through generations. We are honored and grateful to be here today on their traditional lands. Uh, I would like to honor those who, um, my colleagues and broader community members who have worked to uh, develop this land acknowledgement. Um, I understand that it's a institutional device um, and it has its limitations, but in sharing it, um, I, I honor those who have um, worked in order to uh, discuss the way in which um, the land that we exist on um, has a history and a history that histories um, rendering our experience historical, which I think Marisol and John's work uh, does seek to do. Um, so uh, as a brief uh, bit of um, uh, in my role as chair of the cultural studies uh, graduate group, I would just like to make a couple of um, announcements very briefly, if I may. Uh, tomorrow, there is a talk uh, called Hate and Healing, a conversation on anti-Asian violence and anti-racist coalition building that is being put on by um, or organized by the Asian, Amer um, Asian American Studies Department here at UC Davis. Um, it's a talk that's facilitated by Ga Young Chung. That's going to have James Birch, policy director of the Anti-Police Terror Project, uh, Professor Milman Harrison, uh, who's uh, faculty in African African American Studies at UC Davis, um, and Ishi, uh, executive director of the Asian Arts Initiative, uh, Professor uh, Rana Jalil, faculty in Gender, Sexual, and Women's Studies here at UC Davis, uh, Megan Sapigal, coordinator of Sacramento Asian Pacific Islander Regional Network and Jennifer Nguyen Bernal, uh, an undergraduate here at UC Davis. I circulated this flyer um, amongst the cultural studies graduate group today. I hope that you'll join the conversation. It's tomorrow from 12 to 1.30. And then uh, future colloquium for this quarter, uh, we have uh, next Thursday, Lorena Oropesa, uh, who's professor of history at UC Davis is gonna be giving a talk on, based on their new book, King of Adobe, Reyes Lopez de Jirina, The Lost Prophet of the Chicano Movement. Uh, it's a book that's won some recent awards from the Amer oh, it's won some recent awards published by the University of North Carolina Press. And the talk is gonna be introduced and moderated by Lorena Marquez, who's an assistant professor of Chicana OX studies at UC Davis. And we're reprising an earlier conversation that they had where um, Lorena Oropesa was introduced and moderated Lorena Marquez's discussion of their new book, La Gente. Uh, so we're flipping the tables in this talk and looking forward to it. And I hope you'll join us. And uh, thereafter, we have a talk uh, scheduled for David Eng, who is the Richard L. Fisher Professor of English at University of Pennsylvania. Um, again, a talk based upon a forthcoming book. Um, the talk is called Absolute Apology, Absolute Forgiveness. And it's based on the forthcoming book, Reparations in the Human, which explores the history of reparations in relation to Cold War, Asia, beginning with new world discovery and indigenous dispossession and concluding with the biopolitical aftermath of atomic destruction in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And then lastly, uh, on and that talk will be on April 29th. 
Uh, lastly, on May 13th, we will have a talk by uh, a colleague um, of Marisol's from the history from the anthropology department at UC Davis. Alan Klima will be giving a talk on their new book, Ethnography Number no. Nine. And that talk will be introduced and moderated by Colin Milburn, a professor of English and Science and Technology Studies here at UC Davis. So um, thank you for allowing me to provide some general introduction. And um, uh, now on to uh, Marisol, it's an enormous privilege to be able to introduce um, Marisol de la Cadena, a scholar whose work I read um, in, in seminar and who has been deeply influential in thinking about um, the multiverse, a, a world where many worlds are possible, um, thinking about um, thinking outside of the discourse of um, actually uh, thinking outside of the language um, that we are discursively um, shaped into. Um, their first book, Indigenous Mestizos, The Politics of Race and Culture in Cusco, Peru, 1910 to 1991, um, is a his historical and ethnographic analysis of race relations in the Andes, and their most recent book from 2015, Earth Beings, Ecologies of Practice Across Andean Worlds, is based on conversations with two Quechua speaking men that lived in Cusco, Peru. Um, they share in their bio that um, they engage practices and relations between people, cows and things in general, thinking at divergent biogeal interfaces and capturing the stuff that makes life and death in conditions of dramatic ecological and political change as the country endures extreme droughts and floods and wants to transition between the violence of war to a condition of peace that might not be without violence. So it's thinking of a world beyond the limits of the present. And it's about thinking um, beyond the conditions of possibility that uh, we often that become naturalized through ideology. And so um, I look forward to today creating some space in cultural studies to think beyond the limits of the present. Um, uh, and I think doing that is incredibly important for for a hope of, a, of another way of bringing forth another way or reaching to another the other ways that currently exist uh, to show that what we have today is not all that there is. Um, so thank you both. And I'm gonna pass it off to Marisol now who will introduce John. And I thank you all for joining us. Gracias, Carlos. Thank you, Carlos. Um, John, it's a great joy to have you with us uh, and a great joy to introduce you. Uh, John is currently director of the Américo Paredes Center for Cultural Studies at the University of Texas, where he's also professor at the anthropology department. And John, in addition to being a wonderful musician and uh, an extraordinary animator of all kinds of life, is an amazingly prolific writer and one who's able to make connections really uh, across humans and non-humans. His work um, started as a conversation on race and most specifically on whiteness and class in the US. Um, about race and class, he published several books. In 1999, Racial Situations, Class Predicaments of Whiteness in Detroit. In 2005, Odd Tribes Towards a Cultural Analysis of White People. In 2010, Race in the 21st Century, and that's more of a textbook to teach ethnography, I think. And then um, he also published What Can You Say? America's National Conversation on Race um, towards his facet as a public intellectual, um, which in which he's also very uh, present 
her, himself and um, prolific as well. In 2010, he uh, wrote, uh, published Millennials for Obama and the Messy Antic Ends of Race. In 2010, what does race have to do with it? Making sense of our national conversation. And that was published in the Chronicle of Higher Education. He has published OPEDs, um, like Is the Tea Party Racist? Uh, public in a local Austin um, uh, magazine called the Austin American Statement. And in 2008, What If Obama is Wrong was published. Uh, and How to Talk uh, About White People. And that was again published in the Austin American Statement. So he managed to connect his scholarly what work on race. Sorry, his scholarly work on race was a uh, public persona, public intellectual persona, talking about race at a very crucial moment. Um, when when has race not been a crucial issue in the United States, right? But then what John did was to think from human race and humans as a species to species to non-human species, and he moved from uh, the United States to Mexico. And he published, he did research and published Care of the Species, Races of Corn and the Science of Plant Biodiversity in which he has an, ama an amazing chapter where he interviews plants or tells us how to interview plants. Um, this was preceded by two articles uh, in which he thought about the connections between human race and the race of corns. Um, of corns, yes, different species, of, different types of corn in Mexico. And he published that in um, scholarly journals. Um, his latest work, is has moved from plants as species making the having made the connection between human species and plant as species or more specifically corn through the notion of race to animals and uh, and he has carved a niche to think about the culture of animals in anthropology um, in in that field, in that, in that specific site, he has published Aesop's Anthropology, a multi-species approach, which is a short, super clever um, take on animals' culture and anthropology of the culture of animals. Then he has moved from Mexico to, and from plants, to horses uh, and Spain, and has published a book of which, from which he's going to talk today. Um, that's the title of which is Shaving the Beasts, Wild Horses and Ritual in Spain. And um, he has a forthcoming book, Social Theory for Non-Humans by the University of Minnesota Press. And all that in about, 15 years. So four books, many, many, many articles, many op-eds and teaching and directing a center in an amount of time that many of us would publish probably only two books like myself. <laughs> so um, with that, welcome to UC Davis Cultural Studies. I'm thrilled that you're here. And I am very happy to engage um, in conversation with you and invite everybody to take notes and also uh, provoke a conversation. Uh, Carlos said that I was going to moderate the conversation. I think I'm gonna tell you that I'm going to in moderate it. So uh, starting with that, John, the floor is yours or the screen is yours. Well, thank you, Marisol, and thank you, Carlos, as well. Uh, Marisol, that's such a generous introduction, and I appreciate that, that you took that time to 
weave all those different pieces to you together and um that conversation that you just referenced i think is going to be the highlight you know i'm going to run through my talk and, and get some things going but uh i know the dialogue that i'm i'm looking forward to is, is with you and with um all of the participants who have shown up um i really appreciate that you're here and willing to uh, listen to this um i'm going to talk for probably about 35 to 40 minutes i've got a set of um slides I'll, I'll run through i've also got some some video clips so that'll be cool kind of you know lighten things up a little bit and uh let me just kind of get underway here and I, i've i've posted a couple of links in the chat all, already if you want to check those out um and um yes as as mari sol just you know generously described uh this is my current book and it's it's part of what I'm building as a multi-species trilogy. So beginning with care of the species and looking at races de maíz in Mexico and the, the origins of racial thinking on, on plants and animals, uh, I operated in this book by transposing a series of concepts from social analysis uh, onto other species. Um, so I take care of the self from, from Michel Foucault uh, and, and transpose it via the practices of selfing that maize geneticists do to, to reproduce these races. And then I come up with care of the species. I take social formation and transpose that as species formation. And I'll spend some time uh, you know, talking about that practice of transposition today. Um, this is my next project and I'm I'm writing it kind of in progress. So so here's the platform and I, I, I posted a link. And I'm trying to engage your research in the natural sciences uh, from a perspective of a social theorist and trying to rework social theory uh, around evolutionary theory and get those two in, in dialogue. So um, I encourage you to check that out, please, and I'll be glad to you know, field questions on that. So here's my ethnographic subject, and, and you'll notice that there's no humans there. It, it's just the horses. Uh, and um, this is one of, of, of several bands that I observed over a period of time. And just to orient you, this is in Galicia. It's, in the northwest corner of the Iberian Peninsula. Um, it's, you know, kind of running down through the central spine here. Um, you know, the elevations are, you know, maybe 3,000 meters at, at the top end. It's not, you know, <laughs> it's not like the Andes, but, you know, it's mountainous, we'll say. Um, and so this, um, this tribe, this population that uh, I'm studying, uh, they're referred to locally as as bestas or burras, you know, beasts or you know, donkeys, basically. Um, and and here's an image from the roundups. I'm, I'm going to be talking about how they are annually rounded up, and then they have their manes and tails sheared off, as you can kind of see here. But what you should should you notice you know, here are, are the horses that I'm studying that have been captured. In the background, you see modern horses. These are, are horses are the product of some 500 years of breeding in Spain, so Arabian, etc. And you can see that they're that they're much larger. This is probably um, a, a, an ancestral population, a vestige population perhaps before the last ice age so they're smaller because they haven't gone through the breeding process uh, and, and, and there's an argument made by a couple of zoologists that they're a distinct line within echis ferris echis um, as a genus there's some efforts there to kind of breed them and, and develop them as a breed uh, you, the effort in portugal keys in on the name Garanos in Galicia, they talk about pura raza, galega. Uh, I'll, I'll be glad to get to all of that as well. Now these roundups, they're called rapas das bestas, or sh shaving the beasts. 
and and these have been um, uh, ongoing for at least 500 years. Uh, th there's a documented historical record that far back, and there's a lot of petroglyphs in this region uh, that are you, you know 3,000 years old. You know, sketching out horses being you know driven into these uh, circular pens arenas. There's a variety of styles of how this rap is conducted. So in Bayona, which is in the south of Galicia, uh, they um, do it kind of the old fashioned way. This is a, a cabestro, a, a kind of harness that they attach on the end of a long pole. They, they gather up the horses by herding them together. And there's about you know, 700 horses here. And, and then they take them out individually one by one uh and then you know shear off the mane and shear off the tail the you, the, the hair of, of the tail in in the north where they're trying to develop that puerto raza galega uh they're much more kind of professional about it so they've got these uniforms that they wear um they um pen them up in a modern metal arena much smaller numbers, uh, much more docile. Uh, what they do is jump on, on the back of the horse and, and then cut its, it, its manes. Uh, what you see in these are clashes between the stallions. So when they herd these bands together, uh, there's a lot of conflict, particularly between the stallions. And this is what people come out to see. You can see them you know, snapping pictures here of these you know, two big stallions going at it. Um, I chose to do the one in Sabucedo, and this one is internationally re renowned or notorious. They um, ha have a huge arena that holds you, you know, at least 4,000 people. Um, here, you know, their style uh, is to uh, have a team of three people. One jumps on the back, the other grabs the tail. They try to get the head. Um, here's a stallion that we'll meet in just a moment. He's being sheared. They, the ideal is to get them on the ground and pin them, uh, but if they can't, like with the big stallions, then they you know, shear them standing up. And then, and then here in Sabuceda as well, the feature is the stallions fighting each other. Now, uh, my, my basic approach here is I, invert a very classic ethnographic analysis. Clifford Geertz uh, went to Bali, and one of the things he, he looked at was the cockfight there. And um, uh, his uh, analysis becomes the basis for what we call thick description. Um, and it's you, you know, still a, a prevalent mode. And you know I'll summarize it here in this slide. Uh, you know, the basic idea, he says, it's not the cocks that are fighting or that are important, it's the men. It's really them fighting each other. It's about status. It, th there's an elaborate process of betting that I can explain later. Uh, but you, the only purpose of, of, of these cocks in this fight is to dramatize status. So he says, it's just an image, it's a metaphor uh, you, to display these social concerns. And like all of us, you know, we're much more interested in understanding men than in understanding cocks. So I invert that. I say, no, let's make the horses the center of a social analysis. And this is a very dense slide. I recognize it. I'll, I'll go through it. Uh, but the, the basis by which I can do this is that horses are a highly social species. Uh, you, you know, humans are not the only social species, and uh, there are lots of, of commonalities in how sociality works. Uh, among other social species. So uh, they, li they live in bands uh, and it's, it's like social life for us. You know, people interact over long-term. Um, there is a lot of kind of micro interaction where they're sorting out status, if you will, or just kind of belonging within the group. There's a lot of boundary work, um, both in micro interactions within a band and between bands. They have pretty sophisticated social 
interactions where like a third party intervenes in conflicts, they have post conflict forms of reconciliation or conciliation. They have a lot of fission fusion dynamics. So group membership is not fixed or static. Um, uh, young st uh, stallions, you know, typically leave when they become sexually mature. Uh, mares will come and go. Uh, and they have a very keen sense of social distance. Now, you know, we've been talking about social distance for the last year, uh, but it's an aspect of the lives of many social species, working out attraction, uh, rejection, and alignment. Uh, so you know, that's how I could do it. And I could do this because I drew upon ethology, which is the study of animal behavior. All of this let me you know, flip Gertz on his head. I'm not going to treat the horses as representations. I'm going to treat them as social and ethnographic subjects. This required me learning how to do ethology, uh, you, you know, how to go out and make systematic, methodical observations of horse behavior. And I participated in a study of Guranos in, a, in, a, in an adjacent range in Galicia, and I learned all these kind of, you know, quantified techniques, how to sample, you know, you can either take you know, little random slices of behavior or you work continuously, you key in on one or two uh, prominent horses, you work at mapping where they're positioning themselves on a daily basis or, you know, longer term, and most importantly, learning to identify individual Horses, and that <laughs> that took a while. I will I will tell you that. Um, what it was important for for me to learn is the um, the horse ethogram. It's their kind of species typical behaviors, but also to understand their co communicative system. And and fortunately, with horses, it's very visible. They they have enormously large eyes. Like ostriches and whales have bigger eyes, but that's about it. Um, so it's pretty easy to follow <laughs> what their eyes are doing, but they don't just signal with the eyes, their ears rotate, their ears tell you where they're paying attention and, and they can direct it forward uh, in a kind of affiliative way. When they get bent back, they're generally angry or defensive or aggressive. Um, and then just a broad range of vocal communications, um, nays, whinnies, knickers, etc. And, and you can tell a lot um, about their emotional state based on, you know, how they are, are vocalizing. And I couldn't even get into smell. That's just, you know, a completely different register. But basically, when I, I learned to do ethology, I learned to observe basically affiliative and uh, aggressive gestures. So here, uh, you know, these two mares are engaged in allo grooming. It's when they kind of get at the hard to reach places behind the neck of each other. Uh, here, you know, they're engaging naso naso, so they're exchanging a lot of you know chemical sensory information, uh, and then just you know positioning so the tail is there to keep flies off your your uh, your mate. And then there are aggressive gestures. There's kind of a set repertoire, and, and these are, are bite threats. So here on the left, you have a yearling who is warning this three-day-old foal that she's too close. You know, get away from me. Uh, and, and this is the boundary work and, and the micro interactions. Here are, are two mares, and this one's gotten too too close to this one, they're they're together, but this is too close. Uh, and you know, just note that that this is a gesture at at biting. We're going to see some some real bites in a minute, uh, and there's a very stark contrast. But it's gestural and saying, okay, you know, here's an implied threat, but not carried through on it. Now, um, what I did was basically take Irving Goffman's work on interactional analysis and apply this to the horses. And I'm able to do it because they have a lot of very ritualized forms of these interactions. I transpose the concept of face. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll go into that in just a moment. Uh, but the kind of face work that humans do, you can see it in horses. It shows up per, particularly at moments where we're greeting each other. Hey, you know, we're the same as we were before. 
or you know, farewells. Hey, we'll be the same when we come back together again. Well, horses have, have vocalized rituals around uh, greetings and farewells. And they also have very good ritual forms of conflict. So here are three stallions. There's a band stallion in the middle, getting into it with two bachelors. Um, and they go through the uh, kind of you know, genital investigation and nose to nose investigation. And then the kind of uh, you know, band stallion sort of rears up and, and, and chases the other two off. So there's a lot of ritual form here. Um, but faces, we, we know that they transmit a huge amount of social information. Well, you know, that's true for primates generally, uh, horses certainly. They have a very rich facial repertoire. So it works quite well to, to take Goffman. And there's a, a, a kind of anatomical basis for, for doing this. A, a lot of the musculature in horses' faces is very similar to humans. Morphologically, our faces are different, but anatomically, we're quite similar. And so here you, you see broken down the, the sets of muscles that humans have in the face that horses do as well. Uh, and when, when they do these facial action coding systems, you know, it's like same code and muscle, same code and, and muscle as for humans as for horses. So there's a very you know, firm foundation um, anatomically for uh, what I'm claiming here. Then theoretically or analytically, here's Goffman's concept of face. We present a face, you know, and I've, I, I hope that you all recognize mine and, and you the same. Um, and we engage in a lot of face work. And, and one of the key things about face work is, is looking away, you know, so like, you know, somebody's got, oh, hey, Hardigan, you got something in your beard there, right? But, but, but you don't have to say that. So you sort of like, don't quite look there, you know, and think, oh, that Hardigan, man, he's a sloppy eater. But instead of you confront me, geez, you're a pig, he's, uh, you just kind of avert your gaze a little bit. That's civil inattention. There's manifold forms of this. This is how we can exist as a social species. But what I found is that the, the, the horses also engage in civil inattention. And I'll show you some examples of that in these rapas where, they, where they're forced together and they really don't want to be that close. Um, and initially, you see a lot of acts of violence. But then over time, and, and this is about a four day affair in Tabu Seda, uh, you see more forms of civil inattention winning out over the forms of violence. And basically, in, in doing this, I'm saying, well, you, you know, horses are social subjects because they engage in interpretive work in understanding and reproducing, contesting their relationships. It's a performative identity. And that's what the concept of face lets me ar ar articulate. One more dense slide and we'll get back to the horses. Um, horses practice the social gaze. So when you're looking at somebody, you are both transmitting and receiving information. This is really impressive and challenging. Uh, and so it needs to be managed very carefully you know, through these forms of face work. It's a conduit either for affection, you know, staring affectionately or aggression. It, it, it's really very similar. So, so they've got to sort out which it is. The first thing I learned ethologically is don't stare at the horses, you know, look away, you know, kind of look, peek, you look away. Um, but, you know, their commonalities with our forms of social gaze allowed me to really track how they were working this. Uh, and, and so I could observe, you know, basically how they're thinking about other horses, largely because their expressions are meant to be legible. They're meant to be read by each other. And importantly, the effects of those gazes and those gestures are also quite, quite, quite legible. So as promised, here we are back at the horses and we're done with the dense slides. So um, this was on the range where I was learning to do horse ethology. Uh, and it was also like um, a, a wind farm. So you see here on the left, uh, the base of a windmill. You have two bands passing. There's, there's this band that's going up the track here and, and one band that's already in place. What would frequently you know, occur is a clash be, between the stallions of these bands to like demonstrate where the boundary is. 
here's this band stallion and there's that band stallion and this band stallion is staring at him but he's looking away he's like i'm not staring at you i'm, I'm not going to be aggressive and because of that his band was able to pass with, without any kind of conflict so it shows you uh, the sophistication of both the social gaze and boundary work among horses so when i was working on, on my own on the range above Sabucedo, um, I, I concentrated on two bands, at least for the purposes of this talk today. And in doing that, I figured out you, you know, who's the dominant mayor, basically, and I'll kind of show you how I do this. And that's uh, um, Mancha, uh, excuse me, Rabacana. Uh, that's her style of tail. It's kind of a, a bicolor tail. And here's the stallion who we saw getting sheared earlier and i just called him northeastern and the other band was a huge band and was um 40 horses also please note on this range their cattle as well so you know this horse band is, is hanging out on a knoll and they've been joined by the cattle um i called her bald face because that's the style of marking here she's the dominant mare and you can see her dominance in that all these other mares are giving her a big buffer they're standing well back from her. So that's another dimension of the boundary work in horses. And this is Chaparro. That was his local name. And I'll talk about the uh, naming co conventions. So um, um, I'm going to describe now what happens when the roundup begins. Uh, and, and so this mega band was the first one caught. And so they're you know, herded together. Uh, and it's uh, right next to a cattle enclosure so, so there's a fence line there and very quickly uh uh Mancha reasserts her status you know she's over here and all the other mares are back away from her you know giving her her space and it was quite interesting because both she and the stallion immediately begin in allo grooming of these you know younger members so so here's a foal, here's a yearling. I, I, I didn't see them allo grooming any other time, but in this kind of stressful moment, they uh, really kicked in that that was what they were gonna do. So um, I'm gonna stop the share for uh, for uh, just a moment so I can go to my video. And and this is not a high quality video. <laughs> it, it, it's almost crappy. Um, I'm gonna show you about a minute. And this is what happens when that other band the northeastern band is brought in to that spot where they've just been able to kind of stabilize their their uh, situation. So again, you know, it's kind of jerky. I apologize, but here they come. So there's Rabakana and Mancha, who I mentioned. So they they kind of all sort of crash in together here. And there's a lot of displacement. And you'll see a few bite gestures here in, in just a moment, you know, mostly in the poorly lit background. I, I apologize, but but they're shifting about here, here comes uh, uh, Mancha, excuse me, bald face. So she's kind of setting herself apart. Now here's the other stallions. There's Northeastern, he's you know pushing, get out of my way, get out of my way. And we'll see Chaparro in just a moment here. There he is, there he is. Okay, I'm gonna just stop that and I'm gonna stop that share and I'm gonna to go to the really intriguing moment of, um, of boundary work. So what happens pretty quickly, now why won't that do? Okay, here we go. Um, the bands sort each other out and it starts here with, with, with Ravikana. Uh, so she's making a bite gesture over here at this uh, mayor who, who from the other band, and and very quickly, this boundary opens up in between the two groups, and they're like they've purposefully separated. That lasts for about ten minutes, and then it breaks down, and they start kind of socializing across that space. Here's the uh, the uh, the northeastern stallion. They're you know curious. They're out there. They're checking each other out, but then the stallions get too close to each other and they clash. And so here are both of them, Chaparro and uh, northeastern. He's hurting. 
So he aims his head low at their ankles. It, it's a very dangerous threat to like bite them. And that drives all of his band members to one side. Chaparro is doing the same. And then in a minute, you have this huge boundary between these two groups. So what they've managed to do, that we forced them together, they've separated themselves socially. And they're engaged in very active boundary work in doing that. And they're able to do that initially, but that doesn't last. As more bands are brought in, more horses, you know, we're talking 300 horses eventually, uh, that ability to do boundary work collapses. So here now the, the horses are being taken down into the village, which is in the background here. Uh, and you can see a couple of stallions clashing. When they're brought down into the village, they're they're turned loose in this large, large pasture. They call it the peche. And there's a trough of water here, you, you can see. And there's kind of loosely milling about. But socially, what's interesting is, is the mares kind of go off on their own. Uh, mare pairs, you know, uh, perhaps a sibling or a, a, a daughter. Uh, and, and, and you don't see the stallions doing any of that kind of boundary work in, in this pesher. The mayor sociality really kind of comes to the fore, and I'll talk about that later. So meanwhile, in the Kuro, this is the arena, everybody's getting ready for the, this big event. And, and this is a, a folk group from Galicia performing in, in advance, so, so heritage tourism is one of the dimensions and you can see up here all of the media that that's there there are you know film crews from around the world again it's a very notorious event um, and then they bring in the horses and they do this in batches of, of about you, you know 40 or 50 at a time and um uh what what i want you to see here this is actually on day three when, when there's fewer people. This is what's called the elevator effect. You know, when you get into an elevator, you know immediately you don't start conversation, you don't get in somebody's face, you look straight ahead, you know, you try to maintain distance. Well, that's what the horses do initially. This is what they would prefer to be, you know, also all looking in the same direction, you know, as, as much as possible, and then all, you know, distinctly separated. But that doesn't work because the principle of the of the rapa is to cram as many of these horses in there as possible, uh, and so that uh, incapacitates their ability to kind of attack the humans. So here I'm, I'm going to show you what this looks like, uh, and um, I'll show you a couple of. Oops, sorry, hang on. I got to share my screen now. Um, here we are. And I'll you know, just show you a, a few minutes. And, and so there's an announcer like at, at a rodeo. You can hear him in the background. Um, and, and what I want you to see, this is when they've got the last batch of horses in. And, and you very quickly start seeing it shift from, from bite threats to uh, actual bites. I'll show about three minutes of this. And note, they're trying to figure out what to do with their face. You know, where do you put it? It's a very big thing. Wherever they turn, they're in somebody else's face, which is an aggressive gesture. But they're also, you know, understanding that there's you know, here's this context. Um, and, and so the stallions kick. The crowd go goes wild. And, and here they're kind of facing off against each other. And, and what's about to happen they're going to extract the foals they're going to come and take the foals out you know largely so, so they don't get injured yeah i'm going to turn that down just a little bit but um uh this really freaks out the mares you know once they take out their foals so the uh, you know anxiety the stress the hysteria just you know ratchets up intensely and there so there's an actual bite now
Another one there. And it's not, you know, totally vicious yet, but it gets worse. So you can see him now coming in. And they like to bring in the kids to, you know, grab the, grab the foals. And there's Chaparro right there on the right, the big stallion from the mega band. And you can see another foal there being taken out. And so they're calling to each other. They're, they're trying to find the foals. There's Chaparro, and, and he's engaging in a lot of biting now. The stallions are the, are the most aggressive there. OK, I'm going to stop that share. <laughs> I've got to stop the video, too. And then I'm going to uh, wrap up here. Oops, hang on. got to get out of here and go back to share my screen and from current slide. Um, so, you know, what you saw in social life on its own, it, it's just gestural, you know, it, but here now in the Kuro, you see actual violence. You also see very exaggerated forms of social gesturing. So, with, so this mayor is doing a head toss and yes, you know, she, you know, she's trying to avoid the fight here, uh, the fight here, but it's an exaggeration of what would be a, a simple gesture uh, out on the range. But but more often than that violence, you see this. Here is civil inattention. They, they're way too close together. They're incredibly uncomfortable. You can see their ears are bent back. They're, it, it, it's an aggressive kind of posture, but they aren't actually biting each other. And, and for the most part, they're working very hard at ignoring each other that kind of uh, you know uh, aggressive aspect this is civil inattention and this is what keeps them from you know just you know, co completely you know tearing each other apart and that's also what keeps us from tearing each other apart so you know here's a concept from from goffman uh, i also take the concept of footing uh, now there's a lot to say about goffman you know what he, he keyed in on a language or you know, body language more. Uh, but the idea of footing is, is, is that you kind of get established and then you can sort out shifts uh, of different kinds of behavior. You know, so, so people shifting in what they tell you uh, to what they're talking about, et cetera. Uh, he talks about in terms of the kind of eavesdropping, but we're always, always sort of, you know, listening in. Um, it, it's how social participation kind, kind of works. So, um, let me show you one last clip, and this is only uh, about uh, 30 seconds, and I'm not sure why that's not visible here. Here, okay, got it. Um, I'm going to go to uh, this last clip. It's not showing. Hang on. Hang on. I, I know why. I know why. Sorry. I need to stop the screen share. I need to share this. Just a quick moment, please. Okay, I, I know how to do this. Okay, stop that. Um, screen share. Okay. Now, this is on day three. And it, you have a trio of mares here. And this is a, a younger one. She's about you know, three. They're older. Now, I'm going to just play this. And, it, you know, this horse over here is going to bite this horse and they're going to crash into them but they're able because they've got their their footing to kind of understand that this horse here is not attacking them kind of on purpose if, if you will but then notice the kind of subtle gesture that drives this horse forward so so here we go so there's that bite that kick they all just kind of adjust and then she just nudges her just that little nudge and and she forces her face 
forward into a very uncomfortable position. You know, and it's, um, and then, you know, I'll show you again. Boom. That's it. You know, so you know, we, we, we've gone from these bites uh, to, you know, back to the, these very subtle uh, kind of uh, social gestures that are very effective. And that's, I argue, because they found their footing. Let me go to my next slide. Oh, I, I think I have to stop that share and then go to this share. Okay, here we go. All right. So um, uh, the progression is, by the second day of this, they're socially broken down, disintegrated. It's atomistic. They're, they're just scattered as far apart from, from each other as they can get. Uh, but by the third day, those two bands have managed to reassemble in the Peche. So here's Chaparro, and here's Baldface, here's Northeastern and, and Rabacana. And the really striking thing is that the stallions didn't go around and herd up the other band members. It was the mayors. It was the mayors who go out and kind of reassemble the social. And you can see you know, she's over here again. You know, she's got her high ground. She, she's away from all the others. Um, so it's really quite striking that, that in spite of all this, they're able to kind of reconstitute sociality. And this is on the last day. Um, and it, 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 it's over now and they're just waiting to be released and, and they're not biting, they, they, they're not kicking, they're, they're completely just calm and waiting uh, for this to be over. And that's, I, I think, a very vivid example of civil inattention. So, you know, there's a lot of cross species thinking we can be doing about crowding and violence, which are, you know, very keen concerns. Uh, certainly for our species, but other species as they face diminishing uh, uh, terrains uh, and uh, easements, et cetera, wild spaces. And it's quite interesting. Franz Duwall did a study of chimpanzees and found that you know, when you crowded them together, they didn't actually have a lot more violence. They engaged in a lot more kind of you know, reappeasement and reassuring, like we saw in that first uh, shot of the Al of grooming with the um, mayor and the stallions, but it, it, it mostly demonstrates animals' capacity for emotional control. This is one of the big points that he makes. Um, and then, in, in terms of, of what I've done here, you know, the, the way I hope to speak to the ethologists that I've learned from, when ethologists work, they create a species typical account. They, they will give you the uniform types of behavior. They Ethogram that are there wherever you see the species. Um, what I've generated is a species local account. It's basically ethnography. Um, and when you look at the species local, what you see are all of these kinds of behaviors, like with the mare sociality, that would not be evident in a naturalistic setting. Uh, and I think that this can be a useful contribution. And also importantly, e ethologists want to work in a natural setting, right? You know, so we get the species typical. But what do we learn in non-naturalistic settings like the Kuro, like the Rapidas basis, much like uh, Anasing working in blasted landscapes? I argue that that you can see dimensions of sociality, particularly it's kind of elasticity uh, when you have a disrupted set setting, a non-natural setting. Um, and then as well, you know, um, I, I'm engaged in a conversation with ethno primatologists who are, are working on taking concepts from multi-species ethnography and thinking ethnographically about their about their uh, their subjects. And what we get, you know, together on is context and place uh, and, and how you know great its importance is kind of in contrast uh, to genetics and um, the environment in a strictly evolutionary sense. So, so that's my talk. I'd like to take questions. Okay, thank you, Don. So we're ready for questions. Um, and while people warm up and decide what to ask, I'll start a conversation. And this is not necessarily a question answer um, 
relation that you and I are going to have. It's more like a conversation. Uh, I, as you were talking, I was thinking, um, so what does your work do that ethologists work do not do, right? You sort of, you answered that with your last slide, but do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Yes, yeah, I, I, I do. I, and I know that this is a dialogue because you know, given your work with cows and, and you know, trying to, you know, both understand them as subjects, um, then you know, kind of learn from the more natural science approach. So, so, so the big difference is that um, you know I'm I'm not bound to quantitative methods. Um, I I I can work in my sort of typical ethnographic fashion, and and I, I'm kind of able to do it. I argue not because I, I became a good ethologist, you know, I'm, I'm okay, but because I can think socially. Um, and so it was very easy to say, okay, this is a social dynamic. And the big difference comes in, so like if an ethologist is looking at this, they'll say, okay, well, we recorded two instances of aloe grooming, okay? All right, well, you, you, there's a datum. Well, they don't really pay attention to what happened kind of before and after. And what we know as ethnographers is sociality is, is continuous flow. Uh, so I, I would be attending to what sort of preceded and then followed the the quantification. So my ethologist would, would say, well, we, here's how many al groomings were occurring. And I said, well, you know, that, that that's between you know these two mares and, and the stallion was kind of hanging out and he was sort of in the way, but then you know, she shifted over and, and, and just see that kind of stuff that ethnographers you know, um, uh, Anastin calls it the art of noticing. And so we pick up uh, lots of little things that aren't going to reach the level of quantification that, you know, aren't going to be, you know, standardized as objective data, but that we can kind of, you know, document in various ways. Uh, and then, you know, sub substantiate, elaborate on, oh, because there's these relationships and sociality is just an ongoing series of these relationships. So there is a follow up to that question. Mm -hmm. um, and I am going to read it. Um, so the person says, I'm also curious as to whether you've presented your research on biology, natural sciences, animal sciences conferences, and how this work has been received in those contexts. And if you haven't, can you imagine how the, it would be received? Yeah, you know, thank you. It it's an excellent question, and it, it, and there's a long response. Um, so um, I, 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 one of the reasons I could do this was I, I presented my work to my colleagues in biological anthropology who are you know primatologists, um, and they were actually hugely encouraging. You know, like I I went and observed this you know one year. You know, I, I got some footage. And I, I showed it to them, I said, oh, you know, I, I think that this is boundary work. And they're like, yeah, of course that is. You know, that mayor doesn't want those other mayors coming here. <laughs> yeah, it's obvious. So, you know, they were like, yeah, this is great. Um, uh, when I, I, I tried to get a version of this published in American Ethnologist, you know, and I the initial set of reviews was the kind of typical, you know, mix, oh, this is great, or this is terrible. Uh, but the editor said, well, you know, typically you would get the option to revise and resubmit, but I'm not going to give that to you because this is about horses. This is not ethnography. So there goes American ethnologist. Um, you know, uh, when I talk with like mixed audiences where there's some, you know, bio anthro folks in there, I, I, I get some very engaged questions from, from them. Um, so there is a basis for for dialogue, but I, I I had the press send you know review copies out to ethological journals. I contacted the editors. I said, you know, would you review this? And they said, no, because this isn't you know ethology. Or, you know, so at, at the level of the journal, it's very hard to to break through the disciplinary walls out there. Uh, at, at the level of of collegiality. Um, 
it's been quite easy. Um, I have not presented this in a, an ethological conference. I have sent copies of the book to the e ethologists that I you know, worked with in a field school. And you know, they've you know, said, oh, it's great, but it's not clear that they're gonna circulate it or they're gonna you know, engage they, their students with it. You know, um, it, it's an ethnography, so it, it's kind of wordy. <laughs> It's a narrative. It's not quite the myth, methodical approach, so um, it's sort of too soon to tell. I'm I, I'm hopeful that it will circulate among ethologists, but um, I've had mixed results. Okay, there's another question. I have a lot of questions, but I'm going to look at these first. Um, and. This person is wondering a lot about the shearing practice. What is it for? Is it similar to shearing sheep in that it is both a maintenance for the animals as well as raw material, or are there different purposes to these regional festive traditions? Very good, good question, and you know, a long answer that I'll, I'll condense. So, um, um, the historically. The horsehair was used for a lot of purposes. Um, mattress tick, you know, for to like fluff up a, a mattress, for a braiding rope, uh, even for supporting, you know, plaster and walls. All of those have been replaced with synthetic uses. So, so now they just simply let the hair fall on the ground. Um, the bestieros, the guys mostly um, who um, you know, work with, with the horses, they argue it's a good thing for the horse. You know, they argue it'll, you know, make them feel better. I, I doubt that, I, you know, they have less tail to work with, you know, for, for, for swatting away the flies. I, I think it's principally a form of domination. Uh, you, you know, they, they go up and I'm going to show the horses who's in charge here. Um, one elaboration on the foals, so, so they will cull the male foals. They'll you know take them out and sell them for meat. Uh, and there's some interesting politics around that. The Spanish won't eat the horse meat. The Portuguese will. It, it's quite interesting. You, you know that might be be changing too. Um, but you know so overall, this ritual is a form of population management. By culling the males, they limit the amount. Of reproduction in the herds, and um, you know they probably did this historically, but it, it's also very important now uh, because um, the, the horses get down on the highway and they get hit by cars, and so the Galician government would like to get rid of them entirely because they're uh, an expense uh, and they're you know like a hazardous species. So 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 they really got to keep the numbers of these horses down. They're also in increasing competition with you know, fellow villagers who just want to run cattle up there. We like to see the horses gone. Um, I should note as well, um, you, the, the horses are subject to pretty intense predation by wolves. So maybe you know, uh, about a third to a, a half of, of the foals are, are, are killed by uh, wolves each summer. Um, and you know, one of the uh, uh, arguments, if you will, for keeping the horses up there is it, it, it distracts the wolves from the calves. So um, they're in a pretty interesting situation. Um, in terms of management, sorry, yeah. If, while we wait for another question, I'm going to ask, um, um, so one of the, purposes of ethnographic work is to say something about the concepts that we start our work with or about local concepts, right? So I'm wondering, what does your work say? How does your work, what does your work say about the concept of the wild, wild horses? So what is the wild in this yes, yeah. word, in this, in this phrase, mm -hmm. yeah. and in, in this setting? 
Yeah, um, um, you, you know, very powerful question. Uh, it, it, there's multiple answers. So, you, you know, their status as wild is disputed. You, you know, so an ethologist would, would, would call them feral uh, with the assumption that they had been domesticated at some point. As I mentioned, you know, one of the zoologists there says, you know, they are probably a vestige population didn't go through domestication. So, so they wouldn't be feral, they would indeed be wild. Um, but there's a lot of permeability between them and the local modern horses. The modern horses escape up there and, you know, the, uh, the best is brought in. Um, in. In terms of EU regulation, they're considered wild um, you know, because they exist by forage, you, you know, they're not, um, you know, contained. Um, but it's interesting that they that they use bestas to talk about it. You, you, they don't say Silvestre, you know. Um, so it, and, and they'll use besta on humans too. So you know, dude, you're muy besta today. You know, you you're really kind of wild and, and out there. In, in, instead of the more kind of you know technical so, Silvestre for like a, a, a wild species. So you know they're they're like certainly drawing parallels, um, you know, between humans. And um, you know, like I said, this has been going on, you know, it, it, it you know, hundreds of years certainly, um, and you know, probably thousands. So this is a companion species, um, and you know, while they aren't de dependent on them, uh, you know, they've been part of the agricultural scene, you know during that long period. So yeah, yes, you know, wild is really pushing it. But um, I, I kind of think of, of Jamie Lormier's version of wildlife in the Anthropocene, you know, just making a, a case that most of our connotations around wild are associations with a kind of a pristine nature, uh, you know, that's prior to, to, to humans and that really limits our capacity to to think about these species which are you know sort of interstitial you, you, you know not, not within the domesticated sphere entirely or like only for a, a moment yet existing out where they're you know predated by wolves and um have to sur survive entirely on their own which you know would count as wild in in some regards uh so there's you know, thank you for that question. Okay, there's another uh, question here. Um, I was interested, uh, says Willie Smart, in the way you narrated homologies between humans and horses, where a similar facial anatomy in horses and humans aids your interpretive capacity. Does this suggest a limit to the method you're developing with species that are less like humans, like? Insects, protozoa require a different approach. Can there be an ethnography or of non-social organisms? Excellent question, and 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 um, yes, it does limit. Um, you know, certainly how I've gone in, um, you know, picks up on these homologies, excuse me, analogies between humans and and horses. Um, there are very strong similarities within our order primates, so it, it would be you know mappable onto baboons and, and bonobos and chimpanzees. I, I, I would argue, but you this would not be how you would proceed if you're going to do like you social insects uh, like ants, for instance. Now, um, uh, you know, we're getting much greater refinement visually it, it, it's seeing ants interacting um, and you know, they have very complex kind of, of hygiene rituals so you know there are other forms that i think we, we could map but uh, this is exactly a kind of limit point um you, you know and uh you know it's it, i mean to you bring mari soul back in here you know it, 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 it probably wouldn't work quite the same way on, on cows so for, for instance, cows have a very different kind of gaze pattern. And you know, like after I hang out with horses, I think cows are really rude because they just stare at you. They, they, they have no problem just doing that. Where, you know, horses are very, you know, look away, look back. Look. So, you know, right between 
do cows and, and horses, you, you would need to do some kind of calibration. It might not be that that concept would work, but I didn't start out with that concept initially. I kind of knew I wanted to, uh, you know, um, focus in on in making the horses the ethnographic subject. And as I, I did that, I looked for you know points of commonality. That's how I came upon the Goffman, um, and, and and that's what I would encourage other. Uh, ethnographers to to do you know as, as you kind of look through um the ethological literature you know find these points that might you know transpose uh and certainly you know goffman won't work all the time it's definitely not a uniform uh, transposition okay several questions yeah justin k yeah. how do you understand the sociality of non-humans to be shaped by human social relations that are historical. I'm thinking specifically here of capitalist social relations, which I would argue determine the sociality of humans to be mediated by their own capacity to, to labor in the abstract. Mm -hmm. That category of abstract social labor seems to be significant for the break or the human non human dichotomy. In other words, the important social difference between humans and non humans is not that human sociality is trans historical or ontological in a way that non-human interactions are not. Rather, the distinction is a historical one. Under capitalism, abstract human labor comes to mediate and dominate human social life. The same is not true for the activities of non-humans, no matter how much they might metabolically or even socially resemble labor. I would even argue that non-humanity is a form determined by the capital relation as non-labor. Uh, and so Justin Kay continues, uh, so that rather than homology, how does difference in the sociality of humans and non-humans offer an analytic into historical specific social forms? Great question. Yeah, um, you know, are other species historical? Uh, that was one, one of the things I addressed um, in the book on maze. Uh, so I, I took the concept of social formation, transposed it to species formation using Eric Wolf, basically. And it, it worked in the region in Mexico where he had worked. So it, 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 th there are some species. So like one of the chapters is called the sexual history of maize. Um, and, uh, you know, so there are other species that are historical. Um, to get at, at your question, there's an evolutionary di dimension that's key. Your know, humans are the outliers. It, it takes so long for the infant to even be able to lift up its head. No other species is like that, and and, and there's a lot going on there. Um, and you know, the chapter I'm writing now in the you know, social theory book is on the mirror stage. Um, what humans do that other social species do is unconsciously we mirror each other's behaviors. This is very well documented. Um, and however historical we are, the child still comes into its ability by learning to follow the gaze of the mother when it, it's very young. Um, so there are historical and trans historical processes there. Um, the, the differences are, you know, the, the kind of easy thing. The challenge is to think through the similarities. I mean, that's my sense. Nice, more questions. Um, okay, how is this is Adam Garcia? How is the concept of ferality or going wild engage uh, with the question of gender and racialization in a multi species context? I'm thinking about, uh, I'm thinking here about feral feminisms and provocations of untaming. In what ways does your research reach its conceptual limits? And where do you think your method deepens understanding of a studies of species that's not confined disciplinarily? Well, yeah, let me think about that. Um, what, you know, there's a, a variety of, di of dimensions of gendering here. The, so there's the gendering of, of ethology 
which you know principally fixates on stallions. You know, that's kind of all they're interested in. Um, and then there's the the the, the local forms of gender. So you know they they name the stallions, but they don't give names to the mares. Um, and then you have what, what I was seeing revealed in this you know, disrupted situation, and we could perhaps call that analogous with virality broadly, where um, in this situation where everything's kind of chaos, the the mayors sort of take over and, and, and sort things out, and the stallions are sidelined there. So there's a shift in their gender or sexual dynamics that that you don't see in a naturalistic setting. So in that regard, the feral dimensions here of gender uh, is, is revealing something about sociality among the horses that ethology, e ethologists would miss for multiple reasons. Their ideological orientation, their choice of naturalistic settings, uh, you know, principally. I, I don't know if that quite gets to the breadth of your question, but that's you know, my initial effort. It's a it's a very, very complex question. I, I, I really like that question. But I'm going to ask Carlos' question. Uh, Carl, uh, so he asks to both you and I, uh, if we can talk about, and I'll let you do the talk alone, John, if uh, we can talk about what we interpret as culture studies method. How does your work engage and push or align with what you could interpret as culture studies? Brief context. I ask because there is always this open question as to what cultural studies is. My aspiration is to leave this question open, but also to keep it as something that emerges out of practice, praxis in discussion. I didn't say in my opening that John was, um, his degree is from Hiscon at UC Davis, at UC Santa Cruz. So he's not an anthropologist. Uh, we are fellow travelers, and I, I think that anthropology is the most interdisciplinary uh, of all disciplines. So, um, and if I were to answer about an anthropological method, I would say ethnography, but then if somebody would ask me what is ethnography, I would say there's so many possibilities of uh, for an uh, definition of ethnography that I'd rather leave that open. I just think that it's um, a practice that leads you to uh, dense conceptualization, different from Clifford Geertz, um, who said thick description with his work on the Balinese cockfight. I would do um, figure ground reversal, uh, like the one that John has done, and say it's not thick description. It is dense conceptualization that takes thick description to make an abstraction that doesn't cannot leave the description aside. So, but what culture studies method is, John? That I leave to you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I appreciate you kind of revealing me as a, a Hiscon product of, of Donna Haraway and uh, Jim Clifford. Um, you, you know, I. I'll answer kind of big picture. You know, my my first book was on ethnography. My my second book, Odd Tribes, was a cultural history of white trash, where I went back to the 1850s and journalistic accounts and, and good housekeeping, ladies home journal, all of those kind of sources in the 19 teens and 20s, up through uh, you know, rap music in the 1990s. Um, when I turned to the book on the national conversation on, on race. I, I took a year of, of media stories about race uh, from one MLK day to the next when Obama was you know, up for the, the presidential nomination um, and just worked through those. Uh, you know, and then um, I've, I've now segued on to working with non-humans non and in care of the species. And it involves a variety of methods. I would say quite simply, cultural studies is opportunistic. We sort of look for possibilities and, and take advantage of what's there and work with it. And I, I don't feel bound to, to reproduce a disciplinary set of techniques 
that I, I used previously. That's the freedom of cultural studies is it says, you know, well, do what's appropriate for this new subject, this new context. And it's going to involve kind of piecing things together and trying things out. And, and I'm able to do that because my cultural studies training, if I had just been an anthropologist, as my soul indicated, I, I probably would, would not be doing the work I'm doing now. I would, I would uh, say that I am an anthropologist and I did history for my first work and I did empirical philosophy for my second work and now I do not know yet what I am doing. I am um, talking with cows. So how do you define that uh, disciplinarily? I don't know. So I think that um, we can call it a very nice uh, gathering, an excellent conversation. Thank you so much, John. I have lots of questions and the conversation between us will continue. Um, I, one of the lingering questions that I have is, how did you learn to see? Um, because that's, and how did you choose between seeing individually or seeing the band? And uh, what do you think about the individual uh, and the band in terms of, um, are they units? Is the individual a unit? Is the band a unit? Can they help us think about um, that kind of abstraction in a different way? Um, anyway, there's lots and lots and lots uh, of things to talk about and I'd love to continue the conversation. And thanks very much to Culture Studies for Thank allowing you. this encounter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank <coughs> you.